With karate, I'll kick your ass from here to right over there. Oh, yeah, motherfucker, gonna kick your fucking dairy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You broke the rules. Now I'm pulling out your pubic hair. You motherfucker. You motherfucker. You may have noticed a little bit of extra gusto on that there intro. And that's because I have a world-class vocalist as my guest today on Mikey Likes You. And I don't mean that as some type of sarcastic comment. I mean, legitimately, a man who has sold more records than most people. A man who is adored worldwide, not only for his fetching good looks, but because of his immense talent and because of his undeniable charisma. One of the men who is known as the principal member and songwriter and frontman of the Dirty Heads. Ladies and gentlemen, Jared Watson. How are you, sir? We need to do this every morning. Does it make you feel good? Makes me feel great. Right here. Well, I wish my wife felt the same way. <laughs> do you do that I wish every she was like, though? hey, hearing you say those things every day makes me feel good. But she's like, oh, another day. Got to yeah. wake up next to this guy. Yeah, she's jaded. How are you, man? You in, uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing very well, man. Thanks for having you me on. You on tour? Yeah. Where are you right now? We're in Milwaukee at a festival, Summerfest, the first uh, first festival, like a three-day festival run, but it's right in the middle of our normal tour. A place like Milwaukee, I love that city, by the way. Like, you're from Huntington Beach, okay? Yeah. And I'm from... I'm from Southern California, not necessarily like a beach town, but I'm I'm from a a place where summer doesn't really seem to end except for like November, December. Is do you notice that people really appreciate the summer months a lot more in a place like Milwaukee? Like are they much more apt to celebrate the fact that it's just not shitty and snowy? I I 100% I would think so. I mean, that's what I would do. And also we we we're a summer band. I feel like when, you know, yeah. when we play, you can tell when we play in the summertime, our venues are these pretty massive outside venues. You know, when we go out in the fall, we're playing big theaters, you know, so right. we kind of just stick to the summertime. Um, it's, it's really weird. Like there's, there's a couple bands, you know, with my history at K rock and, and doing and love line, especially because out of any, radio environment love line was really strange because you got this really kind of intimate connection with your guests because you're there there for two hours which is an eternity you know for a radio interview and you get to talk to them about almost often most often it's like these really private conversations because the topic nature of the show is like sex and drugs and abuse and shit like that so I, you know, there are these handful of bands that I really kind of feel like I got to know as people. And there's honestly, there's like three or four that I can think of that no one is more committed to like the, the comprehensive idea of their music than you guys. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you're the, the fact that you guys make your music. It's not just like, Hey, let's sell some records. This song seems like it'll be catchy. The, the the lifestyle and like the ethos of the dirty heads is is everything you know like who you are as people your message it's it's all kind of one package yeah man that means a lot and i i think you nailed it and i think you you don't realize that when you first start writing music you kind of just do it for yourself and well at least, at least in our, our our situation and then it beca it becomes this community, right? It like becomes this actual thing where you're like, well, this is a lot bigger than me, right? And and also from the beginning, I feel like we probably had kind of similar friends, similar upbringings, similar like right. kind of. Uh, there was a thing from the beginning, even with the band members, that we were going to be ourselves the whole time. Like we were just going to 
that's the best thing that we can do. You know, we can't put on any masks. We can't put on any facades. We're not good at it. We're not, you know, we're just, we want to go play music and we're going to be ourselves. And we've done that from the beginning. And I think that has a lot to do with also, and the people surround yourself with not letting the ego, you know, there's a bad side and a good side to the ego, but not letting the bad side of the ego come into play. Right. But does, I mean, inevitably, I think, you know, it's going to happen. Right. I mean, I was, I was really lucky that I got clean prior to having any idea that I was going to have like a uh, uh, life in the entertainment industry. I mean, I, I never ever intended to do that. And I got clean prior and it kind of happened after as a, as a, as like a byproduct of the new life I was living. But even as a nobody, even as just a dude who was like bumming around LA there was a time and a place where the lifestyle was fun and it was working. And I have to assume for guys like you in, in the dirty heads, handsome, young, I mean, you were guys were already plugging away prior to um, lay me down, like hitting and, and getting like that big mainstream kind of success, but you were living rock star life. There had to be a window where like the ego and the lifestyle was working and it was okay. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that, I mean, we're all very, you know us, like you said, You, I feel like I, I agree, we got pretty close. We're all good people at the end of the day. So it was never this rock star stuff, but there, there was a time, there was a good five years where the partying and some sort of success was, it was working like it wasn't right. being abused so much that it was a bad thing. Like there, there was a time where it wasn't really a problem when we were just going absolutely bad shit. But I feel like everybody just personality wise in this band, like the ethos of it is just like head down, keep working, stay humble. So it, right. the ego never really got there, but the fun, the partying, like, like you said, it, it was working for a while and I'm glad the way that it played out. I'm glad that our trajectory to trajectory is, is slowly doing this because yeah. when you, when, when I got to a certain point, I was like, Oh, well now the partying is fucking up the trajectory from going, continuing. So I got it. Right. Stop. And it's real. I mean, it's gotta be, I always said like this, this, there was something that blew my mind. I heard, I read an interview with Trent Reznor, I don't know, probably like 2004 or five. And he had just really established like a good chunk of, of sobriety. And he was talking about how he was this, you know, this is 1999. He's a multimillionaire. He, he can never run out of money because there's only so much like black electrical tape and leather boots you can buy. <laughs> and, and uh, he had just released the fragile which was commercially and critically acclaimed. I mean, Spin gave it five stars. It was like this genius movement of music. Everybody loves it. He's selling records like crazy. And at that point, he decides to quit heroin. I looked at my life and I was like, I had shit. I had no friends, yeah. no job, no money, no possibility of going anywhere. I kind of was painted into a corner where I had to make a decision. If I had millions of dollars and endless amounts of supermodels and lots of fame, I don't know. I mean, that seems to me to be a lot more impressive. And I, I just wonder, like, for you who, you know, you've been open about your battles with with not necessarily addiction, but certainly with with partying and inebriation and living the lifestyle more so than committing to doing what you love to do. It had to be really difficult to check yourself when on paper everything's going pretty fucking good yeah man like well one the, the point you made for two or the point i think i was trying to make too is is if if we blew up overnight right at the beginning when i was in my early 20s and yeah we blow up you get millions of dollars a bunch of yes men everything's going good like yeah i don't know if i i don't know how that would have went you know mm -hmm. like i don't know how i would have seen that situation but i remember i text you from my honeymoon from thailand because i ran out of fucking pills 
in Thailand. I had money in the bank. I'd married that love of my life, just the the most amazing like life partner I could possibly think that I had. And, a, you know, and an absolute partner. smoke show, you know. Yeah, no I'm offense, like, what am I? But I mean, a fucking on. ten. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, band it's band stuff you just got to get in a band because there's no way that would happen normally so and we're we're in this villa private villa private island honeymoon everything on paper like you say is the band's crushing everything is fucking perfect i should be the happiest person on the planet and i'm completely miserable completely miserable i'm like on the verge of tears drinking a scotch in the shower wow on my honeymoon at like nine in the morning and i'm like i don't know what to do i i just remember i was like i because i owe you a lot of credit man you were the first person that i reached out to you were the first person that i knew that had gotten sober and that your relationship with drew i felt like you just knew more than like a buddy of mine that probably was still dealing with it you really helped me a lot man like a lot, a lot. So I owe you. Well, I'm, I'm, that means a lot. Thank you. I, but you know, to me, I just looked at it like, you know, it's, there's a strange thing, especially with addiction. I think, you know, I'm in no way trying to compare it, but I think like, um, uh, like veterans and stuff talk about this where it's like, you can have the greatest psychiatrist on the planet who has spent his or her career devoted to studying PTSD. But if they haven't been in the shit, they don't know. They don't, they don't know what I'm saying. Like they can't relate. And, and Dr. Drew's a perfect example. He's not a drug addict, but he spent decades studying the brain and the body's reaction to addiction and how to th- clinically deal with it. But he doesn't, he doesn't get his bones. Don't rattle when, you know, when you're sitting there texting me and I read this, I'm like, I like it, it starts to hum inside. I'm like, Oh man, I know what he's going through. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very pernicious, but also very, very torturous kind of, situation to be in because like you said i mean your left brain is powerful enough to understand like i have everything i should be fucking just on cloud nine right now and and look at where i'm at and uh if you if you don't mind like walk me through where someone finds it within themselves to kind of pick up those pieces and then put it back together to get to the place where you're at right now because like honestly like you look happy and healthy you know what i'm saying you're thin you're muscular you got the bright eyes the whole thing uh yeah man i feel great i i i feel better now than i felt my whole entire life i'm 39 years old you know and it's just i I do it's it's exercise for me that that's the thing that i switched over to it's a it's a free antidepressant It, it it all the benefits that you don't realize that are going to come from exercise you're like oh my god i was just trying to like I was essentially just trying to cheat the system, but let me start from, from where you're asking. So I got, it was my bottom and everybody's can be way worse and it doesn't matter. But, uh, one, I knew that I was affecting my band members lives. They have wives, they have kids, they have mortgages. I'm fucking this up for everybody. If I don't get my shit together. Right. I love those guys. I care about those guys. They care about me, my wife, my family, and the goals that I wanted, the goals that I had. Uh, and I remember being young and always being a really happy go lucky kid, like being the the positive one in the group, being the optimistic one in the group, being the one that I feel like I, when, when I come over work, I'm going to make my friends have a good time. And they know that. And I wasn't that person anymore. And that really fucked me up. I think the reason why I held on for so long was just like, the shame of admitting things that, that, that you have an addiction. And, and I didn't know how to deal with that, but it was cold Turkey. I just, I just finally one day said, I, I can't be miserable anymore. Like I, 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 when I text you, like everything was gray for so long that I couldn't live in that gray anymore. Like there was, I just couldn't do it. I was exhausted of being exhausted and I didn't know how to get out of it. And that was the tricky part. Um, luckily I had people like you, couple of close friends uh there was a ufc fighter and he texted me ian mccall and he texted me and said hey man i heard what you're going through come into the gym because i had no idea yet he said come into the gym and i was like i used to work out i was in serve class i was on track i was pretty fit up until i started partying really bad gained 40 pounds and 
I went into the gym and he ran me through this brutal workout. And I remember for like 30 minutes afterwards, it was the first time in like years that I felt normal and like happy from just me, like happy from just a normal standpoint, not booze, pills, what anything right. outside. And I was like, what the fuck is this? The attic was still there. He's like, okay, well, this is my out. Like I'm going to cheat the system this way. I'm just going to work out like three times a day and just get right. these same chemicals and these same, the same amount of dopamine and whatever. And so that's what I did for like a year. I just worked out twice a day if I could. And, and that slowly brought back my brain health, you know, and in turn my body health, I was doing it purely for my mental health. I didn't, right. I wasn't, I wasn't worrying about abs. I wasn't worrying about my fitness. I wasn't worrying about my cardio, my body fat, nothing. I was just like, man, this is the, I can't drink. I can't take pills because it's just fucking my life up, but I can do this and it makes me feel like I'm on drugs afterwards. So I thought I was cheating the system and then it ended up being really good for me. And it became something that was a habit, part of my life. And between that, uh, I think therapy was great. I, I, I had a really good therapist um, and y y friends like you, but I think really exercise was the one thing that got me out of it. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You know, and I always try to like hammer that on this show that I, I don't really want to try to collect the world in this movement to like get abs or to have a 500 pound bench press. Yeah. But the, mo the, the, the sheer, by virtue of sh committing yourself to doing it, the the latent benefits psychologically spiritually emotionally are so much higher than i think people realize you know and that the the idea of kind of high level exercise and, and nutrition has gotten this tainted uh image of like the meathead or you know the crossfit chick and the reality is is that it's just voluntarily exposing yourself to to struggle that it builds you and be, it builds you as a person from the inside out. And like that, and you know, the abs and looking great is, is an amazing byproduct. And I don't understand. I, I would never want to encourage people not to go for that. But, but my point is, is like the, it really is the core of how I take care of myself, everything else around it, it's therapy and my relationship, my wife, all of that. It, the nucleus is my commitment to doing really difficult things physically. Yeah, it's it it's the the spillage for me. If I yeah. I agree, it's the same. If I don't exercise, do the things that I know, like I have a a very fragile ecosystem, is what we like to call it now. Yeah. <laughs> like I've done a lot of damage. I've done a lot of damage here. I've done a lot of damage to my body. So my my ecosystem's a little bit more fragile. So I have to take care of it when I do those things. And exercise is the core of it the spillage is is joy and happiness not the negativity right and that was my big thing is like i don't want to spill all my shit over all, on everybody else and like you said i think i think for me the biggest thing is that you do get a reward at the end of this you get these dopamine dumps you you serotonin you, you feel great you look better there's all these benefits but to to get that you have to suffer and yeah. Over the years, I've come to absolutely fucking love it. Now, now, suffering, even in other parts of my life, aren't so bad, right? So, like, there's something about the human brain that when you get a reward because you've done something and you've worked hard for it, and you actually push through that suffering, that reward's so much better. But that's the ease of booze and drugs, is you don't have to suffer to feel good. And with working right. out, you got to suffer to feel good but there's something that that's the coolest fucking part. Now to me, that's the coolest part. Big love to Ian, uncle creepy McCall too. He's a good dude. He's a friend yeah. of the show, friend of mine. He's a, he's a, you know, he, again, another guy that it, he got to a point in his life. Now I just don't think people understand unless, unless they're serious fans of MMA. We're not talking about a guy who got to the UFC. He was a world-class title contender in the UFC, former world champion. He's a fucking machine. 
And he was able to do something that so many, especially fighters, but so many athletes can't do. And that's a, he was able to step away and, and to have purpose in his life and move on. And it, he, he's a, he's a really impressive dude. And I, you know, another thing I like about Ian is that he's very capable of going, yeah, I was a fuck up. I was a bad guy. <laughs> you know, I did things that I shouldn't have done. And I, I look back on it with, with regret, but I also use that regret to learn and, and to make myself a better person. So many guys are like, yeah, I used to uh, just beat the shit out of people for no reason. And I used to get in fights every single night. I get kicked people in the fucking head and uh, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Totally good. I mean, that's just, that's who I am. What do you don't yeah. like it? Fuck you. He's like, no, no, no. I was, I allowed the violence to spill out into other parts of life that it shouldn't have. And I was wrong. And, and he, he's, he's bigger and better for that. And I, I really respect that. Yeah. But um, you know, he, he fought with something and we talked about it on this show and, and also off the air um, that I wonder if you as not only a really successful musician, someone in the public eye, but also a front man, you know, that, you know, uh, LVS, you know, lead vocalist syndrome is a thing. And, and I don't mean that as a pejorative. I mean that as like to be a good front man, you have to have a chip on you. You have to have a little moxie. You have to have a little bit of a fucking thing, you know? And yeah. I wonder if, because for me, just as a, as a aspiring rock star and as a fan, not as someone who ever made it, I remember you're, we're close in the same age. I remember being 16 and my idols were kind of fucking assholes, you know? <laughs> and I wonder for you as someone who wanted to be a fucking big rock, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, and I'm not saying the, the, the trappings of it, but just to someone who get on stage in front of thousands of people and command their attention. Was there ever the mistake of following the life path of those men who had done it prior to you? No, no, not at all. I, I think there was some early, there was some early interactions and, and people that I met that, uh, and like I said, it really comes back to the band and just who we are as people. I never wanted to be that, guy like there's so there's there's uh, i think i'm a great front man for our style of music because it fits sure. my personality just like the music does i don't have to be maynard from tool right. but if i met maynard from tool and he was mean to me i'd be like fuck yeah if i met the guys from the kings of leon and they were too cool i'd be like fuck yeah you know we, we played festivals with jared leto and it, it, he he we need rock stars and front men like him that are just sure. like look at me i'm standing in the middle of the crowd my fucking hair is blowing i'm the hottest man on the planet <clears throat> look at me i right. want people to have fun i definitely do have a not a, uh, you know, an alter ego a, a, a there's a different air of confidence there is something that i put on when i get on stage not put on like a facade but it just it turns on like i'm up there i'm gonna fucking crush right now i'm gonna crush switch, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah i'm gonna make everybody have a good fucking time and we're up here having fun um but i remember i matthew mcconaughey was one of the people that i met that i was like pretty scared to meet and he was the nicest fucking guy i've ever met in my whole entire life and it was like i want to be that guy when i'm older he he right. he came he rented out we went out with a band that he was helping he rented out an upstairs bar area so that we could all party afterwards. And I was like, holy shit, I'm meeting Matthew McConaughey. And we start getting drunk. And I'm like, hey, man, Reign of Fire is like the greatest movie ever. And Van Zant is probably one of the greatest characters. His dragon movie, where he's the bald yeah. guy. And, Christian Bale? Yeah. And within, oh, and I said, if I was going to get in a fight with anybody, it would be Van Zant. That's why I'd want to get beat up by. And doesn't skip a beat. Turns into Van Zant, starts doing the accent, tackles me, and fake fights me on the couch. No fucking way. <laughs> Bro, I was like, this is the fucking greatest night of my life. You can take any one of your friends and just move them out and then place Matthew McConaughey in your circle of friends and nothing would change. And that was so impactful to me. Like, you don't have to be a fucking asshole. You don't have to let the ego get to you. 
You know what I'm saying? Was there ever like a surreal? Wait, were you, did you have a pinch me moment? You're like Matthew McConaughey is wrestling with me right now. I had him in like a little mini guillotine, and I was like, "What is going on right now?" And he fucking was ripping me around, yelling at me in fucking Van Zant voice. I was tripping. It was, but he was cool. Oh, uh, you should have sunk it, that guillotine in, and then he would have tapped and gone, "All right, all right, all right." <laughs> Come on, I had to. <laughs> there we go. But it was it was just little moments like that where I was like, man, I can be me forever, you know. And and yeah. I have I don't know if you have this problem, but I have the problem. It's not a problem actually. I figured it out, but it was a problem. Would I be bigger if I put on that facade? Would this band be bigger if we all put on the facade, even to the clothes we wear, to the way we act on camera, and the way we act on stage? If we if we did it more what our fans wanted us to be more heady, more uh, hippie, more yeah. granola, more what, whatever the fuck it would be, whatever our fans really, truly want. Like, I feel like some people have actually nailed what their fans want. Would we be more successful? And I would, would I be more happy there? Or am I happy with the success that I have because I've been myself the whole time? And it's a, come- it's a, it's a really tough conversation to have with yourself. And Lord knows I've had the same thing, you know, in broadcasting, there was, I can't tell you how many times I'd go into a uh, audition for some television stuff or like some radio station would want to think about having me be their morning guy or something. And I go in to meet with them and they're like, Oh, they're like, you're, you're psycho Mike. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, we were expecting some like WWE guy, you know? And I'm like, Oh, sorry. And and I, I'm not telling, I'm not exact. This is not an exaggeration. This isn't just like a cutesy way of, of uh, delivering the story. I can think of three. There probably was more, but I can think of three television auditions to host certain shows, whether they be unscripted or game shows where they're like, uh, we need you to be like more like a Joe Rogan guy. And I'm like, but I'm not really that guy. I'm the guy in the back of the class that told fart jokes. You know, I'm not, I'm not like, I know that I have a little muscle and, and uh, I know that like I have this nickname and I, you know, I always think like, could I have been a bigger star if I just would have leaned into like the Henry Rollins kind of world but I'm not, I'm, I'm the class. I'm not tough guy. I'm class clown. And that's just who I am. And it, there's, there's, there's always going to be that ongoing conflict. What I say to you is for every single person I can think of that has made tremendous success, clearly taking on a persona and doing it well, you know, the, the kid rocks of the world. Kid rock is a dude from like a pretty upscale suburban area of detroit and he's like i'm gonna be a rapper and then he's like you know what i'm a fucking country white trash badass and he just he leans into it and he does it really well like you know good for him there's also there's 20 fucking dave grohl's where you know there's he's just dave grohl i mean he never did like eye makeup and pyro and stuff he's like i like you know being me and he likes his family and harleys and shit and that's who he is and there's there's so many people who have just leaned into really being themselves. And another thing I've noticed, and this is, this is something that I've really analyzed with like internet culture and what kids do when I say kids, I mean, you know, like real kids, like uh, college age and younger, there's so many flashes in the pan on the internet and in YouTube culture and in meme culture and the whole thing. And certainly in hip hop, but the people that continuously make it, regardless of the genre, regardless of the the medium of entertainment, are people who are authentic, even if they're fucking shitty. That one thing the general public, especially in America, seems to be able to pick up on is authenticity. Yeah. And I think it's one of the more valuable tools that an entertainer can have is that Maybe you're not the greatest singer in the world. Maybe you're not the most charismatic frontman. Maybe whatever it is, it's like you can technically analyze things from an objective standpoint. But authenticity will take you a really long way. 
Yeah, that's a good point, man. That's a good point. And I, I feel like it'd be so exhausting to kind of wear that mask. And then it's, it's, it's just adding on to like, it's adding on to that like fraud syndrome that everybody kind of has that I talked right. to like, I didn't know actually up until I started writing music. Like I didn't know I was going to be in a band. I wasn't musical. I didn't, I was like, so, still some days I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is my job. This is my life. Like I, I'm super being sober actually is giving me a whole new perspective on life off also right. it's made me like absolutely love my job i used to fucking get home from tour and be like oh my god i'm so glad i'm done from tour i want to not talk to anybody for a month i don't want to write music i don't want to play music I'm, now i'm like dude i'm so fucking lucky i'm so lucky to be here and be able to be myself and not feel like a fucking fraud because i'm not authentic and i have to lean into that and that's just gonna because even when i am myself i'm still like what am i doing here what are all these people right. doing here you like our songs? We were just some kids in a bedroom. Like, this is fucking crazy. So I think it'd be, I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, you're, you're right. It's better to be yourself and have this amount of success than be fake and have this amount of success. And people can see through bullshit. You're right. You don't think people can see through bullshit, but they usually fucking can. And let, you know, and, and, and there's a difference. I want to make it clear. Cause I think that there's probably entertainers out there who, uh, maybe they're or fans of certain entertainers that they think that I'm saying something insulting. There's a grave difference between putting on a facade and playing a character. Oh, you know, yeah, I, yeah. There's people oh. who play a character and they do it really, really well. You know what I'm saying? Like, that that's uh, making a concerted, uh, um, a great example. Ozzy. Ozzy is a great example. If you've ever met Ozzy when there's not a camera or a microphone, he is, really soft-spoken and very shy and he's not someone who wants to eat bats and you know do crazy ozzy really would like like soap operas and tea um but he's a genius when it comes time to get on stage and he can do that he can become the prince of darkness and that's awesome that's a big difference between being fake but i see a, yeah. a lot of times dude I see it more so, and I would never want to like name names. This isn't a, a trash talking session. I see it a lot with actors where the public has its view of them being one thing and they are not, <laughs> they are not, yeah. They, yeah. they are angry fucking cocksuckers and they, you know, they like <laughs> to pretend like they're fucking everyone's best friend so they can be cast in that next romantic comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's easier to, to, to become successful and be yourself in the music industry because there's the music, you know, it really does come down to the music. You're playing good songs. There's a lot of other factors, hard work and entertainment and, and being good on stage, but it comes down to the songs. You know, when you're an actor, it's you got to fucking or just be in that industry. Oh, we, uh, it's corrosive. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Though, I mean, I'm sure your industry comes with its own trappings. Has it been hard to really, I think like, when you made your first burst of mainstream success, that was like the last era of like traditional music industry, you know, that 2009 ish era. Yeah. That was really kind of the last breaths of traditional music. How has it been to transition into the, the new music industry? I mean, it's never been this way where really streaming and touring is how you make your money. You, you, you don't, I doubt you guys sit around thinking like how many records are we going to sell? That's just not, reality anymore 100 percent. well i don't why I, I don't really use that as a gauge i use our yeah. live shows as a gauge on our on our success and yeah when we started napster limewire came out got dropped luckily got the album back from warner brothers tom wally was really cool and then just put our heads down and just grinded you're right and we got lay me down like on traditional radio and it was like, okay, let's just, it was one of those things where we just kept doing what we do and we kept being ourselves. And it's like consistency. What's that saying? Like consistency and luck equals success, you know, cause you're, if you're consistent, you're eventually going to get lucky. If you buy a fucking lottery ticket every day, you have a better chance. So we just kept plugging and kept plugging and kept working, kept working. It's so funny. Cause I never thought about it until right now. Like what a weird band that we, we had our biggest hit at the end of traditional, like, 
kind of music industry radio and then everything turned mm. into streaming and then we're like we go on tour for 15 years and then seven 16 years something like that and then all of a sudden and we have success of sex to sex and then all of a sudden it's like hey you can't play music anymore the world's fucking gonna turn upside down the music industry is turned upside down we're all sitting in our houses fucking beating off playing xbox not at the same time but you know that's cool too and it's a good time though i mean yeah, yeah. Let's, and, not, let's not let's not you know frown on that that's a good time no, I'm, i just like put a pin in that in my head like okay what am i doing i'm gonna have two screens and uh we're sitting in the fucking middle of a pandemic and then now next thing you know we're two two younger kids we're a fucking TikTok band. We're a streaming yeah. band. We're like we're yeah. a Spotify band. We're an Instagram band. We are a, we are now a popular band in a new form of music. And for us, we're just the same fucking band, right? We're the same guys. But it's just wild how we went from lay me down traditional radio to vacation on an on a social media app. And yeah. Mike has four billion fucking views, four billion stream like uh, not streams, sorry, but views and streams all goes four billion times. They told me that number. That's ridiculous. Like, what? Well, yeah. What? And then, and then, there's always that greedy part of the human brain that goes, "What? Like, I'm not going to get paid that much off of that. Like, if this was the '90s, I would have flown on a private jet to you, picked you up. We'd be in a helicopter right now, probably." covered in like feral cats that I had as pets and probably doing drugs. Right. We'd probably still both be doing drugs. It, 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 it's just oh, wild. No. But every but fiber <laughs> of your, every cell in your body would be blow. <laughs> We'd be fucking it, like better. your actual skin would be composed of blow. It's, it's just wild. And then I go, no, this is fucking, that's not how it is. This is the real life. And do you know how many right. people I now get to that, that now get to hear our music all over the world. Now I'm doing fucking press in Germany. I'm doing press in Australia. I'm doing press in Japan because of that song. I'll take that all day to continue to have the career that I have rather than have that song blow up and go away and like have the nineties funny thing though. But it was, yeah. I, we went on tour with a, a band and they're a little older than us. And I asked one of the guys, I was like, do you guys, like enjoy this still and he was like yeah i love it i was like you don't like need to do this anymore and he was like no we don't we haven't needed to do this in a long time and i was like how and he was like 90s money i was like oh yeah you used to <laughs> you used to get paid you know from selling albums and things like that but you, the the people always say like it's so saturated and there's so many bands and there's so much access to bands i think it's easier now to blow up than it was back then because everything was controlled. If there was, you know, and then if there was one popular band, they wanted three more bands just like that popular band, say Red Hot Chili Peppers. They wanted three bands that were similar to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and the industry kind of controlled that. And you went into a record store and you were going to like buy the Beastie Boys album or like the Sublime album, and that was it. Now you can hit Beastie Boys Radio and find fucking 10 bands that you love and end up going to their show, buying their merch, becoming longtime fans. I think it's easier now to become successful in the music industry than it was back then. Absolutely. And, and also something that I really appreciate as a fan. Um, I love the four billion honestly, dudes. like there's 16 year old kids now that they're going to listen to classic, what would be considered classic bands that in, when I was in high school, if you were listening to black flag, you had to be, really passionate you know or, or, or whatever the genre if you were listening to in 1996 if you were listening to fucking um you know like slayer early slayer or you you iron maiden or led zeppelin or the doors like you had to be a music geek now every kid is exposed to lots and lots of music simply by virtue of the fact that they they don't have a cd that they put in or a cassette they're just intaking fucking streams of shit and it could be anything they were like well this is a good song i've never heard everybody wants some by van halen i don't care that it came out 35 years this is very good you know yeah yeah man so th that's exactly what i'm saying like remember so in high school whatever like it was slayer like we if you listen to slayer usually it was like slayer pantera metallica Iron Maiden. It was like five or six that you knew about. And if somebody 
showed you like sepultura or something that was you're like what the fuck is this it was so hard it had to be a random person giving you a fucking tape or a cd to find that right now it's not like i I mean we were talking skate videos were essentially in my generation the first playlist where you could find music that you didn't know about absolutely all all these different skaters there was the tech guy that had the hip-hop shit there was the hessian that had the metal stuff you know there was just like every video you were finding songs from these skate videos because there was 12 parts and 12 songs and 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 now it's just it's great for music that somebody can randomly hear a song on a station they created from a band they've never heard and then just go down that rabbit hole like people are getting exposed to so much more good music how many fucking beatles have gone have 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 become a band played and gone away and stopped and not become successful and never heard of them how many led zeppelins how many kanye west how many jay-z's how How many many takashi six nine how many takashi six nines dude six no no, i'm not gonna make the joke (laughs) but there's probably a lot like you know if there if this fucking universe is so big that we could be the 10th iteration of just some sort of civilization imagine how many bands went unheard that are the best bands of human history right the best singer the best guitar player that nobody ever found now it's in the fans it's in the people's hands to bring that thing to the forefront because it connects i'm still finding shit from instagram from social media from youtube from whatever that that I will even I won't even be too cool and be like, oh, that's a TikTok song. I'll hear that song and go, holy shit, that song's blowing up on TikTok. That's really fucking dope. That's really really cool. I can see why that came to the front. That song's six years old. So now it's just it's just people connecting with music, and it's a great song that's connecting with a lot of people because it is a good song and it has something magic in it, and it me it has nothing to do with a label or a program director or money. Or, right. you know, it's just a good song. And I love that. Lack, lack of gatekeepers song. is really amazing. You know? Yes, like, it is. I, I was, you brought up skate videos. I was thinking about like watching people make skate videos in 95, 96, and how much effort went in to really putting together skate parts and like the editing and the music and like having to find a friend that kind of knew photography and lighting. And you know what I'm saying? Like renting the equipment, doing the thing. And now kids, if you shred, just like break out your iPhone, upload it to YouTube. Pretty easy. It's It's amazing. Like that, that access to it. It's crazy how much shit comes from skateboarding. Cause 'cause you got to think about like, we were the first, we were the first like kids making edits. We were the first YouTubers yeah. without YouTube and the only people that see it were your friends. And it, we were making VHS parts, you know, and you're like, yeah, you had to take a you know, month to, to find your spot, find your trick, find your outfit that you wanted to fucking wear, find the music right. that you wanted to put into your thing. And that's all we did. And then like we, I started playing music and I stopped. And then that just became what every kid does now, whether they're playing Roblox or, painting or vlogging or traveling like that's just the norm now you know you know how hard i had to work to get my snuff films out in 1995 no how hard you understand how hard were they i I had to mow so many lawns to be able to fly to the ukraine (laughs) and film myself with igor just just chopping bitches up oh oh i pictured fake of, of, of kind of a fake snuff film where you were dressed up and you were the one that was getting fake killed. Oh, yeah, sure. It was fake. Yeah, of course. That I mean, turned me on more. This is broadcast, right? You killing other people. You dressing up maybe as a woman, maybe as a man, maybe as a Viking, maybe as a clown. All sorts of different outfits. I dressed you, as a Mexican wrestler. That's dope. And my name was El Cuco, and I would... I would travel the world, you understand? And I would take these disenfranchised young ladies and uh, I would do my, my patented move, the Elka Bong. Next thing you know, they're gone. Not a big market back then. Yeah. I, oh, speaking Google. of traveling the world, I get this question 
Understandably. A couple times a day. Hey, I really want to start working out and taking better care of myself, but I'm a mom and I have two jobs and I blah, blah, blah. I'm a, you know, I got three kids. I'm a, I work, you know, I'm a, I'm a fireman. It's, it's tough. It's very tough living real life and then trying to commit to doing that. Being on tour is really demanding as far as the travel and the, and your commitments. Do you have any advice for people to okay, Cause you've, you've already established that it is kind of a foundational point of your life. How do you maintain that on the road? My go-to no excuse is burpees. 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 But I, I, I understand what you're saying. It has to become brushing your teeth. That's what it yeah. is to me. It, 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 it's become a part of my life. It, it's, it's the same as waking up, taking a piss, brushing my teeth, putting my shoes on, putting my headphones on. And the first thing I can do is work out if you don't. If, and, and then if things are crazy, it's that, you know, th then I'll find 20 minutes at some point in the day to do a hundred burpees. Right. It's the holding yourself accountable, which is the hardest thing to do, but then like also maybe setting goals. And it's just one of those things where it's, it's, so easy to make excuses but then you know people don't want to hear the solution to their problem oh i can't work out because i have this i have this i have this i have this you go here's the solution and they go i can't do that well you can it's just on you, you a know? lot of it's changing perspective too where you know you kind of alluded to it i talk about it myself is that once i change my perspective on oh my god i have to go do this it's going to suck to I'm so lucky to be able to have this 20 minutes to, to better myself. It, it really did change everything. I know mean, it sounds so corny. No, but changing my all. perspective on it really changed a lot. No, man. Perspective is fucking everything. It's yeah. fucking everything to me. And, and all, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad I went through, I went through what I did and I'm glad I can empathize with people that have had addiction and, and traumas and things like that. I really am like now there's a whole nother group of people that I could be like, ah, I know what you're talking about. We can talk. Do you need help? I'll talk to you. Just like, you know, like I had a friend, my friend's name was Mike. He helped me. You, you know, I've helped people because you helped me, you know, and now I can empathize with those people. Fuck. What was I talking about? Um, Oh, but, but uh, if I, I'm, I'm finding the silver lining in it. And I, and I, and my perspective now is I'm glad I went through all that. I can empathize with other people. And now I'm glad that if I don't work out, I'm not the best version of me. And that might've happened because I abused my body and my mind, but I'm glad because now it forces me to work out to become the best version of me for my kid and my wife and my bandmates. Right. So if I don't work out, I'm kind of, it just eggy you know i'm like it's just not a it's not the best day i could have and i don't feel great and then two or three days will go by and i'll be at home with my wife like, why do i feel like shit why do why am i starting to get anxiety again and depression why why do i feel depressed well when's the last time you worked out oh man it's been like four days so now it's yeah. like you know i take rest days and i still surf on days off and things like that so i just stay active and it's so fun i'm just fucking living life and it's like forcing me to do the things that I want to do. And it's forcing me to go become a better person. So I like, I have to work out. So I don't really, I made it not a choice. And I don't know if other people can get there. And I'm not saying it's healthy to get there the way I got there. But if it really is a problem with you and to you, and, and it really does bother you, the solution is easier than you think. It is just committing. You know, yeah. it's just that, that initial commitment, you know, it's like any habit, like you just got to do it for like, I try and tell people at home, he's hit me up. I'm like, just 20 minutes, 20 minutes a day. Like you, you said before, you don't have to go fucking do deadlifts. You don't have to go to the gym and like impress people. You don't have to get the, the new kit and make yourself look cool. You don't have to go destroy your body. Go do 10 wind sprints and 25 burpees every time you get done. Go do 15 minutes. Walk around the block for 15 minutes with some little weights. At least start there. Yeah, walking's amazing. It's fine. Do five push-ups. 1% better every day type shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, start, you know, I mean, the uh, last tour, I was absolutely fucking shredded by the time I got done. And I didn't bring any weights. I, I'd, I had 
shout out to on it. I'm on their protein and they've been sponsoring me, getting me all the gear out here and fucking everything. It's awesome. They should sponsor um, me as well. Shout out to on it. Love you. Audrey. Best. Love it. Um, they, uh, before I got them, I didn't have any weights. I didn't have any, I had nothing. And I would just run the grass on, at every venue. You know, there's like the seats and then there's the lawn seats. Yeah. I would just run the fucking Hills. I would do, I would r- do a wind sprint, come down, do 25 burpees, wind sprint, come down. That's all I did for two months. I never did anything else. And I was pretty gangster. absolutely fucking chipped out, dude. Yeah. It was like the most, like I'm, tr- I'm probably, I'm, hopefully going to be back there in like two weeks. I'm trying, I'm doing now. I'm doing I hate to do this to you. I I'm sorry. I, I gotta be honest. I don't want to do it, but I'm a little scared. Someone wants to talk to you. So can you just hold on? Orale, Rudy. Hey, fool. What up? Homes? Hey, like, go. Uh, it's been a long time. I haven't seen you a bit, man. I know I'm uh I'm a little blaze right now. I'm so I can't fully talk. But um, I just want to say what's up. I love your music, dog. I love you. And um, I heard you talking about burpees, dog. Um, when I was locked up for the first time, I used to do burpees so much, dog, and I got fuck like this, like oh, so buff. And then it got too easy, so I started doing burpees with my dick, and um. Let me tell you, for my pito got so muscular that my foreskin ripped off. You know, like um, if you ever see those vatos, don't laugh. Hey, you ever see those vatos in like WWE back in the day, WWF? They would get so like Ultimate Warrior be like, oh, I'm so fucking buff that his shirt would just kind of it would just like yeah. rip off. That's how my foreskin got because my pito got veiny and swole, you know. And then my cellmate, Trucha, you know, he was like, come love my butt, you know, because you have this beautiful cinnamon body that looks like honey glazed. And now you have this big Aztec meat sword, you know, down there in your chones. And I... (laughs) And I, I, so I did, you know, and I was like, don't look at me, dog. And I blasted him. And then next thing you know, his butthole looked like, um, like an onion ring from Carl's Jr. And then it would, but the the skin was like Freddy Krueger's face. And I was like, damn, dog. That's crazy. So I just want to say, like, if you, if you're looking for, como se dice, progression with your burpees, progression, start doing them with your dick yeah and i miss you and next time you're in in la you know you could bring me but i remember that one time you brought me on stage i performed with the dirty heads dog yeah well i mean that that's was, like was that a highlight for you like do you for still sure talk about fool? i think about it for a lot. sure because i don't you know, listen i know i i love my music and i believe in my mu- my music but I never had that like exposure as an artist. One yeah, time I was to... a I was a key grip for Cypress Hills video for hits from the bong, but that was the most exposure I had. Or no, one time I was you remember blue blockers? Yeah, yeah. The, I was yeah, in a blocker. blue blockers infomercial, dog. Yeah. Where I was like, Oh, these sunglasses are dope. I that's cool. Can everybody wear your blue blockers? That was yeah. that. I, I, so I had a couple credits, homie. But what'd you do, I never, with, what'd you do with the Blue Bockers money? Oh, um, I spent it on Scante. I spent it on meth. That was back in the day. I was a different man. Yeah. But I got a lot of use out of it. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. I mean, I got like a free stay at LA County. Yeah. <laughs> And we were, you know, we were I lost a couple teeth. You know, we were trying to I lost a couple teeth, you know, so I lost some weight. Hey, listen, good, I'm gonna let you get back to your thing. Just remember, lick butt, go Dodgers. Thanks, Rudy. See, Rudy, Sorry, I dude. miss it. I miss him so much. 
I know he's, I mean, look, he's an affable guy, but I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take up, take up your time. Like that. Come in like that. Like the non, no knock just cruises in and shit. He got locked down with me. Oh, it was like, Oh, it's just gonna be two weeks. Slow the curve. And Rudy was here. So he had to stay. It's been two years. The fucker won't leave. <laughs> oh, he has a family and stuff, and he yeah. just stays here. You and the wife and the kid and Rudy. Yeah. Next yeah. Thing you know, I'm trying to get romantic with the wife. I look out the window, it's Rudy. He's sitting there with a joint in his mouth. Get it, <laughs> hey man, I'll let you go. Get back to your get back to your boys. Get back to tour. Say hello to everyone, please, for me. I love you, man. I love you. And I, I, I love you back. You. you can always yeah. contact me. I'm I'm so happy to see you. So happy. And uh, let's do this again sometimes. Anytime. I would love to. Thank you, man. All right, buddy.